Smashing. Hi there, everyone. Thank you so much for, for coming along. Um, I'm David Norris, as I've, I've just been introduced as, and thank you for coming along uh, to see us uh, this morning. Um, so uh, the, the talk today is going to be um, uh, to create a haunting, uh, see and air, which in the long term will be about a project that I've undergone in Blackpool, but I'd like to take a little while to um, to introduce the project. So we won't be talking about Blackpool until until about halfway into the discussion. Um, but I, I think it's only appropriate that we kick off um, uh, in one particular manner uh, this this weekend. Um, so uh, if you just take a, a few moments. Okay, um, so a very happy Jubilee weekend to, to all of you um, on this on this special on this special time. There is a point. It's not just a joke. There is a point behind what I'm doing uh, there and and what our, our starting point is um, because the starting point of of this uh, of this discussion today and the work that I'd like to talk about um, comes down to two different forms of spectatorship and spectatorship that are aligned with different types of uh, affect. Um, I'm sorry, there's gonna be no vibes today. It's all gonna be affect. I know it's contentious. Um, so two different types of spectatorship. One, I, I mean, I presume I don't need to justify in a, in a group that looks at the Gothic an awful lot, that horror and the Gothic is predicated on heterogeneous spectatorship or readership um that there are so many different ways of spectating of participating in of interacting with um horror um the uncanny is a different relationship to the shock dynamic is a different relationship to the disgust response is a different relationship to senses of spirituality um and that that's before crossing over different types of relationship with the body um, horror so often is attack on the corporeal form and as such we are limited in our responses to horror only by the range of different senses we have and with people having different bodies people will inherently respond to the gothic and to horror um, in different ways um, and that is such an interesting and fundamental dynamic from one of the other really strong felt pieces of affect, strongly felt forms of affect, which are those relating to um, belonging, to community, uh, to nostalgia, and our relationship with space. Um, this is more prone towards a, a binary spectatorship format of belonging is somewhat binary. Um, you either feel a part of the group, you feel a part of the tribe, you feel involved in uh, God save the Queen, um, or you don't. Uh, and it tends to come down to something, uh, to, to as simple as that. And so the starting point of what I'd like to explore today and what I, what I find really interesting about uh, exploring horror with either place or nostalgia or heritage or anything in that format, is those contrasting forms 
of spectatorship, one of which is about as heterogeneous as any type of spectatorship you're going to get, and the other of which is, if not absolutely binary, at least trends towards um, binary spectatorship of either a sense of belonging or not having a sense of belonging. Um, and so I'd like to refer back a little bit to, to some research and some performance case studies that I have looked at in the past. Um, I usually talk about two. One is this one, which is Solstice, A Twisted Tale of Two Seasons, which is a site-specific piece of performance. Um, you might call it folk horror performance um, that was performed in 2014 by uh, Atmosphere Scare Entertainment Company. Um, this is one in which I performed myself at Smith Hills Hall in Bolton. Um, and I compare this with another piece of work, which is um, Story Beast, This is Bardcore by the um, performer John Henry Fowle. Uh, by the performer John Henry Fowle, which was attended uh, by myself at the Odebell in Edinburgh in 2018. Um, the thing that stood out to me about these two performances with regards to what we've talked about and why these two different performances are at the starting point of, of the journey I'd like to talk about today is that they have a significant amount in common. Um, they both fit into um, Scoville's definition of folk horror, uh, Adrian Scoville's definition of, uh, of folk horror. Um, they both employ uh, a live adaptation of that, which is that they employ um, traditional performance formats in order to explore um, their, in order to present their work. Uh, they both invite the audience into a sense of affect within their performance of both fear, of both horror related dynamics and of nostalgia and belonging and community. Uh, and both employ a distinct blend of relative historic accuracy with regards to their folklore, um, including some historic facts, evidence-based cultural references and artifacts from the past and legitimate folkloric performance um, but they also include, in both cases, some contestable interpretations of historic performances and stretched artistic license in their presentations and their claims. Uh, and finally, they both include some outright fictional aspects um, that are intended to appear folkloric uh, or the folkloresque, um, as is often referred to. Um, so they intend to appear folkloric, but they're not. Um, they're just made up. Um, both of these performances directly appealed to British heritage, uh, made fundamental statements about British heritage, explore matters of their definition or their perception of Britishness, uh, and they employed heritage performance forms to do so. And one of these performances, which is Solstice, uh, the one that you look at here, uh, did so more passively uh, via appeal to a mutual uh, communal cultural experience, whilst the other, this is Bardcore, uh, did so via active engagement with the audience. And what stood out to me about these two works is that they demonstrate two diametrically oppositional forms of uh, folk horror, and particularly with their respect to performing. Um, and they really represent two forms of the binary in terms of their relationship to sense of place, as, as, as we discussed before. Um, they both approach their corporeal assaults with horror-based and nostalgic affect, but one, uh, Solstice, uh, was affirmative in its presentation of nostalgia, horror, tradition, heritage, and community, uh, while the other, Bardcore, uh, was cynical inherently in its presentation of nostalgia, tradition, heritage, and community. So, um, to simplify, I suppose, um, Solstice was this, while uh, Bard Core was this. They also 
in order to do this, curate different degrees of social cohesion within the audience, splintering the boundaries of audience in different locations. One, in the case of Solstice, around the audience, creating a sense of togetherness. Uh, and the other by splitting the audience into individual components. Um, by the management of these dynamics, these two pieces uh, communicate functionally different relationships to nationhood uh, and a sense of place, and in their cases, uh, oppositional respective relationships of the creative artists to 21st century uh, Britain. Um, and it's at this point, I think it's important to talk about um, authenticity, because this this relates to sort of a lot of my wider research, um, because I look at the intersection of uh, live horror performance with identity affirmation um, and conflict um, and authenticity uh, in different identity paradigms is something that's really at the forefront of discussion at the minute. Um, so I'm going to talk about Daniel Schultz's Authenticity in Contemporary Performance from 2017, which in, in that particular book, he highlights the contestability of the idea of authenticity. Um, and the past is very much an area of potentially contestable authenticity, particularly when it comes into the matter of folklore. Um, it's a paradigm that can be presented as rooted in an objective truth. Um, history is sometimes portrayed in public sentiment as a purely fact-based subject and can be perceived as such. Uh, this positions the past ideally as a means of communicating authenticity and with it weaponized false senses of authenticity. Um, looking at Zygmunt Bauman, it positions the past ideally uh, a transmission phase. Um, it seems as though the transition, the tradition is the means by which uh, a transition of an isolable cultural element can be brought from the past, um, indicating that the purpose of uh, tradition um, can be used to create an impression of elusive authenticity. Uh, this authenticity, Schultz claims, is, is central to modern performance reception. Um, it's also what metamodern theorists Vermeulen and Vandermack have centralised as part of the, the post-postmodern experience in which they argue that the contemporary condition rests on creating the sensation of a kind of sentimental authenticity, a romanticised idyll, and where better to create a locus of a romanticised idyll than in the past, uh, particularly if you're trying to create a sense of community and togetherness. Um, ironically, this is it is indeed uh, fortuitous. Uh, this is uh, ideal a weekend uh, to look at this, the sense of a romanticized idyll that is located in the past. Um, so we can see a model whereby tradition and traditional performance formats can be often experienced by spectators as two things: one, continuous, um, as if it is an exact replication of a performance format that was given in the past. And as I say, this is very much the sense that Twisted Tale of Two Seasons looked to curate. Um, it was a inverted commas traditional performance format uh, created in a site specific place, um, which created therefore the overwhelming sense of legitimacy, of authenticity, despite the fact that it had many, many fictive and um, manipulative, if you will, components, if one was to look at it from the perspective of, of authenticity. Um, no cultural element from the past can ever realistically be fully replicated in performance. Uh, time passing doesn't really make that possible, but conditions can be created to create an optimum number of consumers to experience such traditional events as authentic. And you can see in this environment that as much symbolism as possible is being thrown in a site-specific heritage environment to create a feeling of authenticity. Um, horror, especially with regards to representations of the supernatural, implicitly promises the idea that the past can be replicated in the present. And this is why I find it interesting to cross over with hauntings. The supernatural in most representations indicates things that go on after they are ended. Hauntings provide a stimulus that people can continue to go on after death. Ideas can go on after death. Uh, 
curses being passed through generations, artifacts having their same impact through generations. Um, but there are very few things that create a greater sense of continuity uh, than physical landscape. Uh, to compare to other elements of fluidity, it's easiest to see the landscape as being, at least within human experience, permanent and fixed. Uh, and this is perhaps why folklore, um, and we can see that in, in an image like this, uh, emphasizes traits of the landscape to such an effect, as you see in this personification of a character who, within the format of Solstice, was presented as Robin. Um, we see as many semiotics thrown as possible to Im invoke Jack of the Green, John Barleycorn, uh, the Green Man, uh, any, any variation of the personification of summer coming at the same place uh, by the use of a sense of he is part of the landscape, the landscape being manifested on him. Um, and that this authenticity of the landscape going on can be slipped into stories alongside other forms of sensed going on, hauntings, uh, provides a possible explanation of why folklore and horror may sit really well together, despite this dissonance of one is incredibly heterogeneous in its spectator, spectatorship and one is tends towards the binary in its spectatorship. That horror provides parallels of continuity and revival after ending um, to stories of the land. An emphasis on the land provides seemingly robust credibility to supernatural narrative uh, elements. Um, we're going to talk about nostalgia a little bit because both Reyes and Wilson writing uh, about horror film have emphasized the affect of nature of horror spectatorship uh, and the degree to which the response is associated with the genre, fear, the uncanny response, disgust, spectrality, shock, uh, all corporeal responses experienced first in the body uh, and subsequently interpreted cognitively. This is a two-phase process that attacks the body subconsciously and then is consciously interpreted and augmented. Uh, this is a dynamic that's particularly augmented in the live environment where the body is physically present. Uh, we're more aware of our body, um, even though those phases are the same uh, in the other intermediatized performances. Live horror becomes even more body and locations focused when compared to literary and screen horror. Um, the shared space and communal presence emphasizes the location and the shared attachment to that location. And so if you're involved in a, an affirmative piece of work like Solstice, the emphasis on location, the site specific nature means that you feel like you are part of an oral tradition environment. You feel wrapped as a community um, and you are invited strongly towards that very powerful stimulant um, of nostalgia, the catharsis associated with community and togetherness in that presentation of history. Um, affect is a shared attribute of both horror and nostalgia. Jarrett and Gammon highlight the affective nature of the nostalgic response and Saga, Sada Wagstaff has noted the degree to which affect as a response has the potential to elicit embodied physiological responses with very powerful effects and can be powerful enough for both the construction of memory and the access to embodied memories. Nostalgia generates a sense of social cohesion and identity. These traits as part of the nostalgic emotion produce strongly positive sensations in the, in the consumer slash spectator. Jarrett and Gammon find that, quote, nostalgia increases current levels of positive affect, self-esteem and social connectedness, a sense of accepted, acceptance, inclusion and belonging end quote, indicating that nostalgia is an extremely desirable sensation that can have a lasting impact on self-actualization and a sense of community. To set this very positive cathartic response against its near opposite, that of fear and the uncanny and the alienation and isolation these sensations bring is exceptionally powerful. In the Ministry of Nostalgia 2017, Owen Hatherley argues that the British public faced with austerity politics under the post-2010 government, began to appeal to a sense of history, or to be more accurate with regards to this discussion, a quasi-utopianized version of history in order to sell the suffering felt by the austerity policy. 
uh, this position that suffering and communities resulting stoicism and sense of shared hardship as being part of a national story, consequently making austerity feel sold to the population as a kind of national duty. Um, such utopian versions of history and an emotional appeals weaponizing affect usually done in the UK with regards to uh, World War II with imagery such as keep calm and carry on. Um, it appealed to a sense of nostalgia and subsequently becoming part of the language of Brexit, more recently in the language of the pandemic era and the selling of stoicism in that environment. And as we've seen this weekend in the Jubilee celebrations. Jarrett and Gammon identify that reconnection with the past can enter a feedback loop when combined with a sense of dissatisfaction with the present and just as importantly can create a flux between personal experiences in the past and a more general sense of communal history. Nostalgia, quote, hinges on the loss of childhood, yet it enables a positive retelling of that past underpinning family narratives. Hence, nostalgia may be regarded as the longing to return to a seemingly ideal past, which requires memory arisal and an amalgamation of positive and negative states, such as comfort, warmth, and sadness. Note that the amalgamation of positive and negative states, which hint quite strongly on bodily sensations and fundamental aspects of living once again provide an indication of why horror, which brings strongly negative sensations at times, might provide an effective accompaniment. They are quick means of accessing vulnerable states, including the personal states of childhood. And it's extremely satisfying to appeal to nostalgia for politicians, journalists and commentators, generating a sense of lost past, providing very easy, quick wins with the general public that live in an era of affect and ongoing suspicion of fake news and media, uh, where we have a fetishization of the real. What feels real is as or more important than objectivity, and this is veered into sociological scholarship as long with a comp competition, competition for realness with paradigms such as Joe Kennedy's authentocracy, which argues that we must now fall back on some notion of tradition via spurious concern, quote, for real people. This can be observed in performance as well as manifest by the solstice performance to condition nostalgia and to both point out that continuation is not really possible, that folklore is constructed and it's not enduring and that the past cannot be recollected in the present may be more accurate as in the performance presented by Story Beast, but it, prevents, it presents a much, much harder argument it feels naturally dissonant on an intuitive level to the general public and requires a level of distancing from the affective catharsis of nostalgia. Um, this was, as I say, manifest in the performance of This Is Bardcore, a vaudeville stand-up style performance. Um, when producing live folk horror, it's essentially, uh, and this comes to one of the central conclusions halfway through here, um, that it's impossible to remain neutral in one's presentation on nostalgia and thus on the commentary the piece makes about heritage, tradition, and the relationship between community and individual identity. I do write at length about both of these performances in uh, Folklore in the 21st Century, which will be coming out in the next um, few months. Um, I'll, I'll move away from those performances now. I know that I've not discussed them in detail, but it was to give an idea of my starting point for, for where I was going, going forward to when discussing uh, a horror performance in, in Blackpool. Um, the conclusions of the paper, however, include that affect is associated with fear responses and affect responses to belonging are both very strongly felt. Um, they interact with a sense of self in differing directions, that those associated with belonging start in the cognitive systems with a sense of self that is pre-existing, that is then brought out in performance, whereas horror attacks corporeally the body and then is interpreted cognitively. That the heterogeneous nature of horror spectatorship can give way and augment the binary nature of belonging spectatorship. The horror tropes are a very convenient conduit to create the folkloresque, um, the use of pop culture tropes, uh, and variations of folklore seeming things to create a false sense of authenticity. Uh, and the folkloresque is a particularly powerful means of generating dynamics of false belonging. I wanted to explore these dynamics practically to create a haunting. Um, and I liked that idea because spectatorship um, 
confused the boundaries of belonging. Um, the performance of Solstice created this big sense of communal belonging in the room. Bardcore was about placing lines down the room and splitting up audience members. Um, I wanted to create a, a piece of work where there was a degree of authenticity, um, but the audience were aware that some of what I was doing was fictional and some of what I was doing was real, but that they didn't know where those boundaries actually sat. Uh, and so creating a sense of displacement to a past that both does and does not exist. Um, and I did this in exploration by doing something that in my own experience, uh, I would have told myself to never ever do, which is combine two different performance formats. Uh, at this point, we probably need to spend a moment talking about um, the haunt industry that I've been a part of in the past and commercial horror, live commercial horror, and the difference between a scare attraction and uh, a ghost tour. So I've, I've got about 10 to 12 years worth of experience in um, commercial horror, working in scare attractions. Um, scare attractions as defined by Madeleine Holt are, um, I'll just come away here from this. I'll just unshare the screen because nothing much is gonna, is gonna vary um, outside of that, yeah. So Madeleine Holt defines a scare attraction as a venue designed quote, to frighten its audience um, the term does not apply to sites that claim to be haunted by actual ghosts and in fact the venues have a basis in fiction or inverted commas horrible history. Um, that is in direct contrast to ghost tours um, which are predicated on supposed reality and a presentation of inverted commas authentic ghosts in inverted commas, really or really haunted places. I, I use inverted commas a lot, but obviously authenticity is heavily contestable on all of these, all of these things. Um, so scare attractions are a subset of immersive theatre sitting within the division provided by Adam Alston of immersive theatre of inverted, of uh, quote, theatre that surrounds audience with an aesthetic space in which they are frequently free to move and or to participate. Um, scholars of this form often emphasize the spectator's increased agency and control and extend, quote, the participatory nature of audiencing. Uh, and these formats compared to the relatively more passive spectatorship contexts of book, film and observational theatre. Um, this means that in immersive theatre and in scare attractions, the tendency is to give control um, over towards the audience. Um, and that is the secondary um, area where I would argue that there is a significant deviation with the ghost tour, um, because it's not, it ends up not just being, um, oops, um, not exclusively being about um, fictional versus real ghosts, but with those fictional versus real ghosts, there is a change of control. In a scare attraction, traditionally, there is control is largely with the audience in a ghost tour the control is largely with the person giving the tour and it's through that that I wanted to create a, a location haunting that was led by myself as if it was a ghost tour and feigning a ghost tour that actually was a scare attraction. Um, the next stage was to decide um, where I'd like to create this sense of haunting um, with a little bit of a blurb. Wanting to weave a bit of a narrative. And wanting to weave a bit of a narrative that rather than a sense of haunting existing as uh, something to fear, as in most scare attractions, if not in most pieces of Gothic literature, um, the further back you go, the happier the environment was. And this is where I settled uh, on using Blackpool. Um, 
I don't make the, uh, the assumption that, that all of all of you necessarily know what Blackpool is. In terms of my relationship with Blackpool, because I have a personal relationship to it, I was a regular visitor as a child to the theme parks of Blackpool and the Illuminations, which is a light show that, that takes place every winter season in Blackpool. Um, I've spent a decade on and off as a lecturer at Blackpool and the Fire College. I had a season uh, outside on Blackpool front barking at uh, a horror attraction called the Passage del Terra. Um, I was the writer, develop, director and co-developer of the Pleasure Beach, which is the, the big theme park in Blackpool's first uh, adult uh, Halloween event called Journey to Hell. I worked at the Carneski Ghost Train, which was a, a scare attraction located in Blackpool. And I do project work at the Old Electric Theatre, which is the first place where CNR, um, this performance that I developed, was um, created. So I have a personal relationship with Blackpool that's been ongoing for the last decade and that relates to my adult memory and my childhood memory. Um, and so all I felt the need to do was to extend that further, further back. Um, Blackpool is, for those who don't know, a, a seaside town in the northwest of the UK in Lancashire um, that in the late 1800s and early 1900s, really through to the mid 1900s and maybe you could argue as late as the 60s and 70s was the primary holiday location for everybody in the north of England's industrial heartlands. Um, it would be a weekend, particularly summer trip, to get on the train and go to Blackpool and that, that would be probably the most exciting um, day out that somebody, particularly a child, in any time from the 1890s through to the 1950s uh, would have before the onset of regular um, international travel um, for uh, working class people particularly. Um, and so Blackpool was a place that did represent a kind of escapist idyll for the majority of people in the north of England uh, for the first 60, 70 years of its existence as a, a seaside getaway. Uh, and that contrasts massively with Blackpool's reputation now, uh, which largely uh, is associated with um, at best, uh, gambling and uh, hen and stag parties, and at worst is associated with high levels of drugs, crime and poverty. Um, and so if there's anywhere that would want to be haunted, if anyone, if anywhere has a sense of a glorious, idyllic, nostalgic past uh, to be revived, it, it would be Blackpool, uh, somewhere that shows the dynamic of um, of the kind of nostalgic presentation uh, that Owen Hadley talks about in the Ministry of Nostalgia, a place that would want that sense of authenticity, a sense that a place that would want that sense of a recreated past, um, then it, it would be it would be Blackpool. Um, and so I wanted to represent Blackpool itself as a, a, a ghost story, uh, a place that is constantly haunted in and of itself by a an Arcadian past that it is constantly trying to revive um, but remains completely spectral and elusive to it. Um, I did this by fusing a sense of recorded and documented history um, but rather than do a, an accurate historical tour of the location where I was at which was the old electric theatre in Blackpool, I incorporated the folkloresque significantly into the performance creating a sense that Blackpool's history was even more glorious and even more um, aligned with folkloric stories uh, than it truly was. Um, it also appealed to, to geographic essentialism, so I incorporated the nature itself uh, of Blackpool uh, in the exploration of the contestability of authenticity. Uh, and by that, I mean, I didn't just refer to the building that we were in in terms of its real historic uh, past, which was as a nightclub, then as a cinema, and then as a, a skating rink. Um, but I also tied it to further back than that to Blackpool's history in smuggling trades, which it was uh, in the cotton industry, uh, and with um, folkloric narratives of the spirits that had been seen in Blackpool and the folkloric stories that are common to Blackpool all of which um, I had lined to the building, for instance, that um, in the 1870s and 1880s stories took place of, of Blixies um, that were known for um, 
interrupting the smuggling trade, particularly the tunnels um, that were used to, to um, transition alcohol and food goods, um, and created six different folkloric uh, spirits, um, all of which were hidden in terms of their reality, but, but ended up being seabirds. Um, so I transitioned six different seabirds into um, folkloric entities, um, some of which is legitimate. For instance, uh, I'm sure you might know that Manx Shearwaters were historically perceived as witches due to their horrific call. Um, some stories of, of petrels being referred to as, as mermaids. Um, but I took this into a, 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 an extended variant uh, where any folkloric exploration um, resulted in narrative stories taking place in Blackpool that I claimed were true over many decades, um, but ultimately were just taking the traits of a bird that lives in the area and imagining what it would happen if it had turned into um, a perceived spirit or folkloric entity. Um, and use this as a, frame, uh, as a framework to create a site explore, a specific exploration of a building to see really how far a sense of felt authenticity could be stretched. Um, so starting with some authentic history, can I start with doing that with appeal with some reality? And if I start with some reality, just how far can I take what then becomes nonsense? and a general audience will continue to believe, you know, where's, where's the point that I can take it to that a general audience will stop believing the story that I tell about the past of Blackpool if I'm here as an authority figure presenting a ghost story. And if they know that some of it's a lie and some of it's true, where, where will they feel that line? And what's gonna determine where they place that line? Because some of the things that were true about the location were genuinely quite odd. Uh, for instance, it, it had been a skating, it had been a skating rink with a um, a live band that was themed to the Alps, um, which was the case in sort of the, what was a, a bit of a, a, a big. Um, it was it was kind of a fad. Was was what was called rinking in the in the eighteen eighties and nineties, um, and so why these working class people would have. Um, would have been involved in this live band doing Viennese waltzes whilst on roller skates. Um, so there were some pictures that could be created, but they were quite fantastical, that were nevertheless true, and how that could combine with telling what, you know, what I could try to sell as fairly credible ideas of um, smugglers um, seeing spirits in the night that were taking away their smuggling goods. Um, that was essentially just a picture created by seagulls taking chips off off uh, off tourists that's where i got that imagery from um and that, that sense of embedded well that feels about right because it's the sort of thing that happens in blackpool um how much i could weave that in with the past and have people buy it um it, it, it it's inspired a little bit by Darren Brown, who kind of pioneered aspects of this form of performance where you're giving explanations to an audience that aren't necessarily that aren't necessarily true. Um, yeah, absolutely bought that. It, it, and, and, and really just exploring, because I've done it in Birmingham since then with Waterbirds, is how far can you stretch what you can sell to people as part of a historic act? Once you've once you've firstly seasoned people up with a bit of horror with a bit of spook and they're, they're corporeally sort of seasoned. And then by appealing to nostalgia, a sense of belonging, sense of community, um, that sense of nostalgia and that sense of community is so strong. How much can you sell people? And the answer really finding that I found out is quite a lot. Um, using the folkloresque, using things that are just drawn by things that feel as though they might be a little bit right. Um, and, and so that has a lot of whimsical implications in terms of what I can explore in performance. Um, but I do like to bring it back to that, uh, to that rather unfortunate, because we are in this time of selling 
authenticity. And one particularly powerful means of that is selling the past. And we don't, we, you know, if we go beyond things like Brexit and we go beyond things like um, austerity politics and, and that constant trickery with the general British public of talking about stoicism of World War II, um, you can make alignments to, to Putin's Neo-Russia, Novorossia. Um, and the storylines weaved about greater Russia and the storylines that are weaved about making America great again and this sense of um, Schroding is past in different countries that is used to appeal to a nostalgic populism um, of a selectively chosen piece of history that can be selective in the folklore that it employs uh, and find a combination of legitimate past and some authenticity mixed in with a bit of, uh, with a bit of um, snake oil and how easy it is to weaponize those dynamics against people, particularly given how difficult it is. Again, I've not gone into much detail about Bardcore because it would take up talking for 40 minutes about the, the performances in Bardcore than it is to do the work of making people cynical about nostalgic responses. Uh, and making people realize that um, senses of belonging and senses of whether it's shared or individual identity are, are contestable and that people don't want to confront those dynamics. Um, it's a much harder sell than those associated with senses of belonging and cultural identity. Um, I, I will shift on to questions. Um, now because I think that hits me at yeah, about 10.40. Uh, I'll start with Alanis because I think this is, is it something that's particularly strong in Blackpool or does it work because of the general deterioration of British seaside towns? I, I think if, if, if we're talking about this dynamic um, and it's only something that I realised after the fact is uh, for those of you not in, not in the UK, um, there was uh, in the recent political shift uh, um, a large shift of uh, left-wing, of historically left-leaning northern towns um, voting conservative in the last election uh, and one of the more interesting things that as I say, I've realized after the fact is that Blackpool is somewhere where this happened well before everywhere else. Um, Blackpool politically shifted rightward um, for a much uh, a good decade or so has a much longer lasting history of having switched um, to a, 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 a right-wing perspective uh, now, partly you can write that off towards the tendency towards entrepreneurism and small business prevalence within the town, um, but I think it mostly it comes back to this to this yeah general deterioration of British seaside towns and the one thing that exists being a yearning for an idyllic past um, that that we now see in other um, places in the former industrial heartlands of Britain. Um, and that really uh, you can say that if you like Blackpool should have been a warning shot um, and the dynamics of Blackpool should have been a warning shot um, to, to, to how easy it is to sell your idealised past and a sense that you can at least strive for that despite the fact that it remains spectral, it remains a theory, it remains still extant in fragments. And I think that's what's so interesting about Blackpool is that the fragments are still there. There is, Blackpool contains some of the most stunning architecture that exists in the North of England, if not the UK. Uh, the Spanish Ballroom, um, the Winter Gardens, uh, the Grand Theatre, uh, parts of the South Pier um, have some genuinely astonishing bits of curio. Uh, the Blackpool Tower um, Circus, there are some places of genuine physical beauty in Blackpool that, that are these haunting frameworks, these pieces of architecture that, that, that tell of a much more glorious past and that now, if anything, sort of, I mean, walking through there, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's like this, it is a haunted town. It's a place that's constantly singing to you of what it used to be in juxtaposition against what it is now because in your eyesight, you will see closed fish and chip shops. You'll see litter everywhere. You'll see, um, a lot of the time you'll be seeing drug addicts. 
um, you'll certainly see the the bachelor and and hen parties um, that take place if you spend your time there uh, and walk through. Whilst at the same time, you will see these stunningly beautiful pieces of architecture. Um, and that's of course true of everywhere, but I think Blackpool, it, it's particularly, it's particularly evident. It's it's difficult. It's it's really impossible to miss. Um, you get that to a degree in Margate, uh, for instance, somewhere like Margate, but it tends to be more compartmentalized. I think what's interesting about Blackpool is that it's all smashed together. Margate has its sort of curated historical places in little bubbles, in places where it's still all nice, uh, like Dreamland. Um, and then the rest of it is now a decrepit seaside town. Uh, so I hope that answers the question, Alana. Um, so I will, yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd ask um, if, if, there are any, if there are any questions or discussions or refutations even, um, or things that, that stand out in the discussion. <laughs> 